All right, welcome to the Freudian Unconscious Workshop, the seventh workshop, I believe. We are going to be covering two papers from Freud, one from 1907, one from 1908. Um, the first paper is basically comparing neurotic ceremonies, uh, private individual uh, ceremonies that people suffering from neurosis hold for themselves with religious practices and religious ceremonies. And Freud's interested in comparing and contrasting the similarities and the differences between uh, these actions and applying the tool of psychoanalysis to perhaps shed some light on both the nature of neuroses and also the origin and the continuation of religious practices. And then another paper on civilized sexual morality, where he is really laying out the groundwork, I think, for what become his theories of, of, of civilization and its discontents, the tension between the sexual drive, the sexual inclinations, and our and our our, our uh, the necessity to constrain sexuality, the necessity to to um, uh, put it to cultural use, let's say. So I'm going to share my screen, and we'll we'll get into these these uh, these two presentations. So the first one here, you see obsessive actions and religious practices. So obsessive actions and religious practices. As I was saying, Freud's interested here in the uh, obsessive ceremony. Uh, in both sufferers from nervous affections and believers' expression of piety. So basically comparing the types of neurotic patients that would be of coming to see him for the last decade or two and um, what he observes in um, daily social civilizational life uh, with religious believers, and 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 he's 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 seeing commonalities between the two, and he suggests that perhaps we can learn more um, about the psychology of religious life if we are to um, have a better understanding of the origin of neurotic ceremonials which is a, an interesting hypothesis here. And, 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 and you can see Freud here is starting to get more interested in what he can say about social life from his intense studies of um, psychological dysfunction and psychological deviations. So he says neurotic ceremonials, he, he starts to get interested. He said neurotic ceremonials are when people will make small adjustments to particular actions. So for example, I have to have my chair by my bed just like that. Or I have to have my clothes folded just like that. Or I have to have my pillow in just this way. Um, you can see these small little necessities. Um, and that the interesting thing for the neurotic is that if there's any deviation in these small ceremonials, there's intolerable anxiety. So for example, if the chair isn't by the bed in just that way, if my clothes aren't in the order just like that, if my pillow can't be just like this, I, I, I experience it as anxiety provoking. These are the types of things he's identifying as neurotic ceremonials. Um, you know, it, it, it it can be very, 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 very minute things. That, that's, I think, the, the main point. Oh, so he here offers a definition of the neurotic ceremonial, which I think is quite nice. He says, the neurotic ceremonial is an exaggeration of an orderly procedure, which in itself is both customary and totally justifiable. So you know, to have your chair by the bed like this, or to have your clothes folded in a particular way, or to have your pillowcase just like that. There's nothing in and of itself wrong or strange about these things. It's just that the neurotic has an overly conscientious and an overly anxious disposition towards these things. 
and they stamp them as a sacred act. And there's also a link between the compulsion to do it and the prohibition against it. So I need, I need, on the one hand, I need to have um, my pillows just like that. And if my pillows aren't just like that, I, I can't, I can't function. So these ceremonies can go on for an extremely long time, totally private, totally disconnected from social life. So there can be a long-term concealment. There can be a long-term concealment, what he calls secret doings. So someone can have this secret uh, neurotic ceremonial. No one knows about it. No one's really aware about it. Uh, it might start to bleed into social life after a long time, you know, um, something like this. Just a sec, I'm gonna. I'm just admitting everyone into the, I'll go back to full screen. Let's see here. So let me see. Yeah. So, uh, Everin, if you could just mute your audio. Sure. Thanks. So the neurotic ceremony, so then he starts to bring this out into uh, uh, the comparison with the religious ceremony and applying the psychoanalytic analytic technique to understand what is the neurotic ceremony. So. The neurotic ceremony is a private act, which on the surface of the phenomenon, you might say is senseless or foolish. Like for example, why do you have to have your pillows just like that? Why do you have to have the chair just by the bed like that? Um, I have a friend, for example, who needs to have his blinds just like this. Like he has his blinds and he needs to have the blinds adjusted just in this particular way. And if the blinds aren't in just a particular way, he doesn't feel comfortable in his room and sitting down and talking. So on the surface, it seems senseless and foolish. Why do you need to have your blinds just like this? But nonetheless, it's necessary. So the religious ceremony he's saying is a, on the contrast a public act. We go to Sunday service. We observe certain holidays. We observe certain meanings which on the surface seem full and rich in meaning. Um, so Freud applies the psychoanalytic technique to the neurotic ceremony. And he says, these, these neurotic ceremonies are perfectly meaningful as soon as you understand that they're serving the interest of deep unconscious affect. Meaning there's a deep unconscious affect which needs to be expressed in these ceremonials. Um, and that the, the, what they represent are an intimate part of the self. And usually if you, he says, when you do psychoanalysis, they're revealed to be connected to sexual experiences of the patient's past. So that's, that's coherent with, with, with Freud's previous hypotheses on, on the unconscious and unconscious sexuality. So he gives an example of, for example, the chair needs to be just by the bed with one of his patients who has the statement. I think this is a quite brilliant um, expression of a symptom. She said, it's so hard to part from anything, a husband, a chair, upon which one has once settled. So you see why the chair needs to be by the bed. It's, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for loss. It's a metaphor for intimate connection to something you settled on. It's, it's a metaphor for the self's security. It's a metaphor for the self's comfort. It's, it's a metaphor for the pain of loss. So when the chair isn't just by the bed like that, you experience anxiety. Well, this subject experiences anxiety because it's hard to part from anything upon which one has once settled. It's, it's a totally logical, emotional, affective response. So the neurotic obsessions 
are he's saying here are ceremonies that are a measure of protection against anxiety or anxious affect. And you see how important anxiety as an affect is for Freud. From the very beginning, you remember from our first workshops, anxiety is a very special emotion. And we know from Zizek, for example, the, the axiom, anxiety is the only emotion that doesn't lie. So the hypothesis on religious ceremony values is that now he's taking some liberty and drawing an inference from what he knows about neurotic ceremonies and psychoanalysis is maybe religious ceremonies and values are defenses or protections against social reality of sinning. So in the same way that the neurotic ceremony is a type of way to, and we'll get more into this, to contain the anxious affect of the, the sexual instinct, he's saying that this religious ceremony is a social sublimation of this same process. So the primary fact is that religious is a repression of instinct. His, this is the hypothesis. Religion is a repression of instinctual impulses and drives and a psychic reaction formation against temptation. So these ceremonies are kind of containing, transferring, sublimating primary sexual affect into a socially meaningful, civilizationally, con culturally constructive form. So this is a very interesting um, uh, formulation. I wanted to highlight this formulation because I think it's, it's, remar it's a remarkable formulation in my view. He says, religious ceremonies and values, quote, represent something permitted, which is not yet absolutely forbidden. Isn't that a remarkable formulation? Represent, what does that, and to go deep, I don't think we fully know what that could mean. Represent something permitted, which is not yet absolutely forbidden. So he gives the example of marriage ceremony. That here we have a uh, something which is making something both compulsive and prohibiting something at the same time. So in the case of the marriage ceremony, you have a sexual enjoyment. You presume, you assume the married couple here are going to be having sex for the first time in now in Freud's context and in traditional religious context, that the married couple are going to be having sexual enjoyment for the first time with each other. And outside of that marriage ceremony, the sex act is sinful. So you're both granting permission to a compulsion of sexual enjoyment and at the same time, absolutely prohibiting it outside of this. So that's the, the, the meaning. So religion here is a general repression and renunciation of sexual and socially harmful impulses and temptations. It's kind of like a cultural vehicle for these, these sexual, sexually and socially harmful uh, formations to make them, to hold them temporally in civilization. So the conclusion is, that obsessive actions possess a quality of a compromise between the reality of the instinct and the drives and civilization and social demands. It's kind of like this, 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 it's a compromise formation basically between two contradictory forces. So the, the obsessional neuroses he says are a pathological counterpart of religion. Whereas the neurotic ceremony has its source in sexuality, whereas the religious ceremony has its source in ego. And of course, ego is the image that we use to socially organize our civilization. So, um, and I, I'm, I'm a massive fan of his final sort of formulas here at the end of the paper, where he says, neurosis is an individual religiosity and religion is a universal obsessional neurosis. I think these are such, and he, he develops, he, we're going to go deeper into this in the next paper, but I just think these are remarkable formulations um, and, and ring and ring, if not, you know, totally true. I mean, I think that there's a, a, a huge degree of truth in these um, formulas. So that's, that's the, um, that's, that, that's the first paper. 
Um, so we, we can, we can go into that, um, now, I mean, I can give some of some other thoughts I have on that, but if, if anyone, feel, please feel free to, to, to jump in if you feel so inclined. I mean, I just, I, I love this notion of the neurotic ceremony as a private religion. It rings true for my, both my own affect and, and rings true from what I've seen from, from so many people when you know them very closely, that they have very small, very seemingly insignificant behaviors which they need to do like like i've seen like for example like I, ha I had one i think like i i have one friend who needs a pepsi with spaghetti for example it, it's not a negotiation it, it, if he doesn't have the pepsi with the spaghetti he becomes anxious or or or, or you you need to sleep in your bed at night you can't sleep at a friend's house or else you'll become anxious. I, I've had so many things like this where things just need to be just like so. Like again, my friend I was staying with in the summer, he needed to have his blinds just in a right way. Remarkable. Otherwise he's anxious. So th there's these little things we need to do. Otherwise there's an overwhelming anxiety. And then his hypothesis is that that these little builds up of neurotic fixation become the source and the foundation of how the ego and that these when these neurotic ceremonies remain private and socially isolated for a long time, but that the buildup over the over the course of historical time and civilizational development are the ground of the religious scaffolding where everything, we need to go to Sunday service at just this time. We need to read this book just like this. We need to, and so, or else the anxiety will be too much. We need to have a ring on someone's finger if you're going to have sexual intercourse. <laughs> so these little things. I wonder what the role of God might be. Freud doesn't speculate on this, but maybe he is just avoiding conflict. Is God an excuse for these compulsions? Maybe. Well, in the, in, in the next paper, I don't know if he says it in this paper. In the next paper, he, sa he, he talks about sacrifice to deity. So I, 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 you could substitute deity for God. You know, you, you, we make a sacrifice. We renounce a bit of our aggressive... He says we have to sacrifice our aggressive, omnipotent impulses of the imagistic ego. We can't, like, I can't just, I can't be God. <laughs> so I can't be God. So I have to do a sacrifice. I, I don't know. That's that's the formula that that it seems to that he's coming up with. What 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 I don't like. What I don't understand yet at this point in in these workshops is how Freud comes to a strong atheistic position. I, I don't understand that move because when I'm reading these papers, I, I, I'm I'm what I see is a, a a sophisticated anthropology of religion which is, or the possibility of a sophisticated anthropology of religion, which is, which paints the picture that we couldn't have not had religion. Like, like I don't know how you could do civilization and, and somehow things would function without it. Uh, so, one of these um, personal religions I have is that when I go to sleep, I have to have a glass of water in reach. I don't even <laughs> drink it most of the time, but if it's not there, I'm just so thirsty and I'm like, oh my God, or I will be thirsty, so I have to have it. But 
I think what's fascinating is that, you know, I can just bring it into here that I do that, but still there is this, if we believe Freud, like this, this unconscious ideational content, there's like, this is the thing, right? He puts the blinders in a certain way because he had an experience in maybe he needs to feel like private or that people will see it's a paranoiac thing. So, or maybe, maybe it's totally different, but this ideational content. So like how, how, how do you even bridge this gap? <laughs> how do you do that? Like through psychoanalysis, right? Through the therapy itself. Well, the thing that the clue the the clue that I the clue that I'm having is when it comes to these little ceremonies, he says that the ceremonies themselves are totally like in some sense, like they're totally logical, normal things to do. Like there's nothing there's nothing weird about wanting to have a glass of water by your bed, for example. He said the we he said I think the, he's saying the weird thing is that without it you feel anxiety and there's this compulsion of necessity for it. And like, for example, like, for example, like there's nothing wrong with like, for example, someone who, who like, I know a few people, for example, who need to have all the clothes folded in a certain way. That needs to be a certain, like, otherwise I'm, there's nothing wrong with wanting to have your clothes folded but why is there this extra, it's this extra affect. It's this, this extra unconscious affect, which, it, which, which, which seems to basically not have had proper outlet, not have had, mm -hmm. and so it needs to attach itself unconsciously to a substitute, a compromise formation. I, I don't know what the I don't know what like the only solution I feel would be like like we're just at the beginning of learning methods to help people feel fully I I don't I don't know well, what we the, need them yeah right I think that's also a big part of it that I mean, I can, I was reading it and I was thinking of all my little, um, I think we can say symptoms, right? These, yeah, the Khan would call them, or maybe also Freud, but that um, we get a lot of enjoyment out of them too. Like when it's just, it's yes. just right. There's a lot of videos on the internet when ch things are just falling into place perfectly or yeah, this kind of thing. There, there's a fantastic and anxiety when like, you know, like these memes where something is exactly wrong and people are like, oh my God, why is it like that? Maybe it's the same. Ab absolutely. I, yeah. I'm just, I'm recalling now one of my favorite Radiohead songs called um, Everything in Its Right Place, where he just repeats mm -hmm. everything in its right place. It, everything has to be just in its right place. And it, and it gets this, it's this excessive need for order. We should also emphasize that need uh, it means differently in compulsions. It's not the need that is sublated by desires, uh, like Bruce Fink explained uh, the need, demand, and desire. This need is a different one. There's certain transitivity, like one person says other that you need to do this, which means. Uh, I am forcing you to do this. <laughs> There's a certain compulsive meaning of need, which is different mm. from the uh, satisfying need, bio biological need. It's psychic. Would you say? Would you say? Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, a need that is symptomatic. Mm -hmm. The re the reality of the symptom. Yeah, uh, but it's also social. Mm -hmm. When one person says to another, "You need to do this," uh, which means I need you to do this. Yes, yes, mm. yes, yes. I, that that I've had that experience with people who will go 
nameless at the moment. But I've I've had that experience many times. Many times. Yeah. 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 That's 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 I think that's where I think that's where the neurotic ceremonial be becomes social. Like like and I think that that starts to happen in the family. You you can't you can't like I think I think in families like especially nuclear families or families who everyone living in the same house. Only certain neurotic ceremonials could become totally private because you're living in the same house. There's like an overlap of neurotic ceremonials which need to be then further compromised with between everyone in the house. And then that's like a little religion. If 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 everything if everything doesn't fall into just its right place, there's going to be anxiety. If, although the God would be an implicit factor in that case, not explicit. Not explicit. Yes, that's true. Not ex not explicit or the the you know the patriarch of the house in old old times maybe. Patriarch of the house might be yeah. a little mini mini god, <laughs> a mini mm. a little mini phallus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, isn't it crazy? You have said it also, Cadell, that Freud didn't conclude from this. Okay, so we need a psychoanalytic religion which will mediate this process the most effectively possible. Yeah, it's remarkable. That from because from... I exact I read exactly like your um, like your uh, big topic right now, which is like the evolution of religion, uh, thinking religion as part of our evolutionary process. So how didn't they, but this is exactly what Freud did in this paper? But still, somehow he's not like yeah, psychoanalysis maybe that should be a religion. Yeah, and I think the I think the mystery of this is only going to deepen as we go deeper into Freud's work, and and even with even with the next paper, like he he comes up with he comes up with I don't want to jump too far into the next paper, but he develops this sort of develop well he develops a developmental theory of religious sexuality basically, and, and, and problematizes the the third stage he's saying, but which you know we but but i think it's i think it's that we're 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 wrestling with this enormous dialectical process and and you know you know perhaps perhaps freud would have come to these conclusions if he read hegel to be honest hmm. to to be fair to freud he didn't read philosophy didn't really read hegel and he didn't really care too much about philosophy but to me, with a Hegelian reading of this, you you get that sort of view. Well, what I heard is that Freud was influenced very much uh, uh, with Spinoza. Spinoza had a great influence on Freud. And Spinoza said, you know, like everything is God, nature is God. So Spinoza basically said, you can't ex escape religion. Now, I don't know that much about Spinoza, but it seems to come close to the things we are talking about here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also, Lacan, Lacan said God is unconscious. Yes. Well, Lacan, Lacan, I, I do think the the theological paradoxes implicit in Freud's work become more directly tackled within in Lacan. Like become more they, they become they become wrestled with in a in a more sophisticated way, I think. The theology in Lacan. Maybe uh, demands have prayer value. Uh, the addressee, uh, whenever something is said and there is an addressee, uh, God is there, as implicitly. Yeah, the other. I mean, doesn't also uh, Lacan claim that the real is God, in some sense, the real which we have no access, but always returns where it is and shatters the reality. So can we say that he was more, I mean, not at least uh, compared to Freud and Freud was more, I mean, 
ateist compared to Lacan in this sense? I, uh, I think he talked about a real aspect of God, uh, like uh, Kadal said, sacrificing to the deity. And well, in ancient cultures, the deity might not like this is what like this was the logic of ancient world peoples or many ancient world peoples was you can sacrifice to the deity, but then they would say if something goes wrong, the deity didn't like your sacrifice. So <laughs> we have to sacrifice something. This was the, the logic and we didn't sacrifice enough. <laughs> so the deity came back and, and sm sm smashed everything. I don't know if God and the real are, are equal in Lacan. In my reading of Lacan, God and the real are not quite synonymous with each other. Yeah, I, I don't, think... We can go into that a lot deeper. Ishik, you pointed towards it, I feel like, when you're saying Lacan says explicitly God is unconscious. But, and, 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 and that certainly means that... Um, you know, God and the real have something to do with each other, but I don't. I I don't think of them in my head as strictly synonymous. I don't know if anyone has 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 a a, a perspective on that, but or it might take us also a little uh, further uh, away from Freud. There might be a real aspect of God, like imaginary yeah, father, I like symbolic father, real father. Yeah, there might be an imaginary God, symbolic God, and real God. Yeah. Yeah, that's how that's how that's how, that's how that's how I've thought about it. And and these simply these these distinctions are just not present in Freud. They're 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 not they're not there. I, it, it's it's clear to me that with these papers, what we're seeing are the beginnings of what you might call a Freudian anthropology. Or a, his his attempt, his attempt to go into the social from his original understandings of the the psychic dysfunctions and the psychic disturbances, and I mean, to me, to me, what I'm interested now in is how do we link the reality of our psychic disturbances, and I think this is how we need to to be more sophisticated than the new age spiritual people who have this sort of Jungian God, because it's, it's like somehow religion and God are linked to these dysfunctions, disturbances, then as something sort of positive. It's, it's more this contradictory compromise that's, go, that's going on. And then you have to think religion and social life from the perspective that this is the this is the ground upon which religion is being built, not the transcendental images necessarily. That's the imaginary God, I guess we could say. There's, I, I guess that that's where I would say the distinction between the imaginary God and the real God is like the imaginary God are these transcendental images of God, whereas the real God are in these gaps, these dysfunctions these compromises where maybe Ishik here we have this problem of the authorization crisis that you're saying with symbolic authority and so forth this huge problem of, of symbolic authority yeah like a Christian God the Christ is like an expression of a crisis a yes. shared a shared crisis yes yes you know I, I think it's a remarkable symbol the 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 christian the christian the christian the, i mean the, the the symbol you see at the front of every church is the the jesus on the cross i think that's why hegel claims that christianity is only the true religion in this aspect uh, so maybe it's a God, but not a big other. I mean, 
I I think I think that's that's it's I I I so deeply appreciate the symbol of Jesus on the cross for this for this reason of the that the highest is the lowest. Like it, it's not this perfect image. It's the exact opposite. It's your. <laughs> X, this, that's where you are. <laughs> I love this. If there's, if just because the next paper is so directly connected, I'm going to go into the next paper unless anyone wants to 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 say anything else about this paper. And they're they're so closely linked, we're going to be able to bring them back and. Yeah, just this um, this thing about. Um that Hegel really worked at the intersection of things and he really worked with contradiction. And every time you had, you know, let's say right now you have the scientific ego community, which is like a religion is naive. And then you have the religious fundamentalist community, which is just like, no, this is the absolute truth. And like you have Hegel with Christianity, which is like, yeah, like this poor man is our connection to God in the most godless situation ever. So like, yeah, if you feel like the most terrible as a Christian, you're in a concentration camp, you identify with Jesus Christ and that's your bridge to God. So do you believe in God then or not? I, yeah, it's, I think that that's really what uh, you could also said, like that's what Freud misses. This kind of, in the end, Freud wants to <laughs> go either way, you know, like wants to go one way or the other way. He doesn't have like, I, I think he doesn't have this absolute knowing of like we're always no, going he doesn't. to have to work with this contradiction and it will become more intractable in the process. Yeah, so, but at the yeah. at this at the same time, some of his formulas point towards it, but yeah. not quite like for example, that's why I tried to highlight um one of the one of the quotes that I thought was remarkable is um religious ceremonies and values represent something permitted which is not yet absolutely forbidden like it's it's like he's pointing towards this intractability the impossible real this 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 working with this contra constant weird tension but he doesn't quite you know and and to you know okay freud's not perfect <laughs> <laughs> no and neither are we <laughs> but Bless, bless the father, nonetheless. Yeah, and one, one <laughs> thing I think that's very uh, interesting is that in um, like very homophobic uh, cultures, they say that homosexuality, homosexuality is not permitted and that it doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I was thinking <laughs> when I read this, that this kind of status of... Yeah. Uh, yeah, because not like not only is it not permitted, <laughs> but because also in, religion, in, a, in religion, in like marriage, they don't say like, yeah, you can have marriage and then you can have all the sex you want. And let's talk about how we all have sex within marriage. No, it's like, it's not really acknowledged in the end. I like it's it's a very nice thing what you're pointing out. Zizek, Zizek says that it's it's related to the weird nature of the big other, meaning it. In the eyes of the big other, it doesn't exist. It's prohibited and it doesn't exist. But as long as the big other doesn't see you, it's okay. You can do it, like have gay sex or whatever. But as long as the big other doesn't see it. So make sure you keep it in the shadow. This, this, type, of, this type of function. I like that. So the next the next paper the next paper is a bit longer. Uh, very interesting paper again. So I guess share share my screen. Okay. All right. Civilized sexual morality and modern nervous illnesses. So Freud jumps on a a, a theory. I'm not going to pronounce his name, but a theory of sexual ethics by well von Ehrenfeld, let's say. Um, from just the previous year, who makes this clear distinction between natural sexual ethics and civilized sexual ethics. 
I actually quite like the definition. <clears throat> so he says the natural sexual ethics is lasting possession of health and efficiency, whereas civilized sexual ethics is intense productive cultural activity. And Freud's hypothesis is that there's a hegemony of civilized sexual ethics, basically, where the intense productive cultural activity is dominating and over-determining the health and efficiency of single individuals. So this is the level where single individuals, their health and efficiency can be impaired for the intense cultural activity of the civilization. So this is where he locates the dimension of sacrifice, that the individual has to sacrifice his own individual concern for health and efficiency for some greater civilized cultural product. So Freud suggests or is pointing towards that we need to reform civilized sexual morality or ethics or else we're gonna end up in a situation where all sexual life is prohibited except for in monogamous marriage. So this, this statement was foreshadowed in the previous paper where he, he made that statement that I, I highlighted a few times about religious ceremonies representing something which is not yet totally prohibited. So he's basically saying that this is the telos, this is the direction of civilization's cultural activity, which is basically the total prohibition of sex unless it's fully concentrated into monogamous marriage. So he then goes on to say that from what he observes, there's an increase in nervous illnesses, which is even the reason why psychoanalysis is developed in the first place. Psychoanalysis is developed as a historical phenomenon because the nervous illnesses of civilized life and that this nervous illnesses of civilized life is basically a culmination of the opposition between our natural constitution and the demands of civilization. So as civilization makes more and more demands on our mental effort, on our ability to achieve mentally, there is a greater tension with our quote unquote natural constitution. So it puts strains and stresses onto the nervous system. And of course, in our current day, our life, especially everyone in this Zoom call, for example, I'm assuming, has to put a tremendous amount of mental effort into their becoming. There's a tremendous amount of intellectual activity which has had to go into making us the individuals we are, um, which would be absent in previous historical epochs to the same level of mental exertion. So he's saying the psychoneuroses of hysteria and obsession are symptoms of this tension, which are going to increase. So he's saying the obsessions and the hysteria should increase. These symptoms should increase because they should become the norm because simply of the repression of instinct and the transmutation of the instinct into these higher civilizational demands. So it says each individual must sacrifice their sense, their sense, which I would say in a Lacanian sense, their supra sense of omnipotence and aggressivity of the personality, this specular image, the imago in Jungian terms, but just the, simply the specular image. So there's this sacrifice or renunciation as a progressive notion here, Freud's saying, that there's a telos in civilization towards more sacrifice, more renunciation. And what is the sacrifice towards? What is the renunciation towards? It's towards deity, he says, or God. And that the acts 
the acts that we sacrifice are sacred. So think about sexuality, for example. It's a sacred act we sacrifice for a higher, higher deity. Individuals who fail to sacrifice or renounce, he says, repress instinct, are perceived as criminals or outlaws unless they're an exceptional man or a hero. So for example, if you're the top, if you're the top musician, or if you're the top athlete, or if you're the top movie star, you are not a criminal for having whatever you like. You have there's different rules that apply for you versus uh, versus the common man. So it's just this. <clears throat> the general trend is this mass need for sacrifice and ren for renunciation. Well, in that context, it's interesting that we deify the modern pop star, for example, or we deify the certain cultural figures as little deities. It's almost like they enjoy for us in this, in this sense. So he makes an interesting notion, and I, and I can confirm this to be 100% true from my studies of primatology and animal behavior, that the sexual instinct is stronger in humans paradoxically, because it's constant. Whereas in most animals, sexual uh, activity is periodic. For example, I studied lemurs one time in my master's and I went to study lemurs on an island and I went to study them during their yearly period of sexual activity. Their sexual activity would come on for one day. And that's, that was their sexuality. This just periodic cycle. So civilized activity here depends on this constant sexual energy being ex exchanged for a civilizational activity. So the capacity for sublimation is equal to the value of civilization. That's the, the, crucial, the crucial notion there. And then the problem is, is that the sexual instinct varies and the capacity for sublimation varies depending on individual constitution. So basically, some people, and we're going to go into this in great detail, some people have a higher sex drive than others and some people have a higher capacity for sublimation than others. And even Freud said, that man has a higher capacity for sublimation than woman, for, ex for example, which is a very, I think, controversial statement, but I think at least demands some attention. So the paradox, the paradox with this is that the sexual instinct in man is not serving reproduction. We force the sexual instinct to serve reproduction, but the sexual instinct in itself serves this type of pleasure, this type of what Lacan calls jouissance. And this I think is the crucial difference between thinking in a Darwinian way and thinking in a Freudian way. Because for Darwin, Sex in instinct is linked to reproduction and evolutionary fitness. Whereas in Freud, sexual instinct serves a type of pleasure. It's a very important distinction. Um, and then, of course, we all know from previous workshops that the childhood polymorphous autoeroticism becomes constrained toward the genital love object in service of reproduction, and that's normativity. That's what we call normativity. But in this process of sexual normativity, the sexual excitation of the subject's own body is inhibited, and this is where the neurotic ceremonials come in, 
as soon as the sexual enjoyment and the sexual excitation of the subject's own body is inhibited, there's this need for the neurotic ceremonial in its place. <clears throat> so the reason why it's inhibited is because it's serving this reproductive function or it's serving civilization in the capacity for sublimation. So then he comes up with a dialectical theory of stages of civilization, which I think are, are precise. We could debate them. He's saying the first stage is the sexual instinct can be freely exercised with no regard for reproduction and no regard for cultural sublimation. The second stage is all sexual instinct is repressed except for what is in service of the aims of reproduction. And then the third is the only legitimate reproduction is allowed, only uh, reproduction is allowed as a legitimate sexual aim. So that's the height of civilized sexual morality or the universal neuroses um, of his time. Um, it'd be very interesting to apply this to a theory of human civilization writ large and also to humans who didn't exist in civilization until recently. To, to, to see how this dialectically stacks out and, and also in our current 21st century society, how are these stages being experienced, enacted, enforced or not? So he says the sexual instinct here from autoeroticism to object love with the aim to unite the genitals has two deviations. The first deviation are the perverts, and they have an infantile fixation to a preliminary sexual aim, which prevents reproductive function from establishing itself. So basically, you just want to be in the first stage of sexuality for him. You want to be in the stage of just having free sexuality with no concern for reproduction whatsoever. And that's the pervert. So... Then you have the second deviation, which is the homosexual or the invert, where he's saying the sexual aim has been deflected from the opposite sex. And this, this is very interesting. It's actually something that Alexander Bard uh, focuses on a lot, is that this deflection of sexual aim from the opposite sex opens up a higher capacity, what he calls a special capacity for sublimation. However, with both of these deviations, both the pervert and remember, I think as Zizek says, today we live in a perverted society <clears throat> for the pervert and for the homosexual, they can lead to extreme forms of unhappiness and social uselessness. So it's a risk. It's a risk for the pervert and the homosexual to end up in these these dead end pathways, but there's also interesting possibilities in these pathways. Then for the people who are in the normative path for the autoeroticism to the genital love object and the capacity for reproduction, he says there's the weak sex drive and the strong sex drive. So the weak sex drive, the total, he says, Total repression is possible, but they don't achieve anything. So in other words, they're inwardly hit inhibited and outwardly paralyzed. Then there's the strong sex drive where you could have the person either remains perverted, having sex, free sexuality without reproductive concern and so forth but he has to deal with the social consequences of this activity, meaning other people don't like it or other people frown upon it. Or the second possibility is that the education and the social demands allow for a higher possibility of sublimation. Um, 
Yeah, that's super. This is super interesting classifications classifications for me. I, I can definitely situate myself with these classifications in my particular symptom. Very interesting. Um, then he goes on to, per, uh, to repeat the formula, which I think is so precise, which is neuroses are the negative of perversion. Basically, what the neurotic is capable of building up is the negativity of its perversion, meaning that it couldn't actualize its actual perverted drive. So it had to take the perverted drive and turn it into its neurotic identity. And this is such an interesting formula that a neurotic is, quote, more noble minded than his constitution allows. I think that's such a nice, that's such a nice formulation. And then this is the final slide. He just leaves us with some questions, which maybe we can consider collectively. So he says there's a social injustice, which is the demand for uniform conduct in sexual activity, because some can easily follow these demands. And for others, it's an impossible sacrifice. So the three questions he leaves us with are, what is the task that is set to the individual by the requirements of the third stage of civilization? This question still hasn't been answered. We don't have a theory of value what is actually being asked of this higher stage of sublimation? What are we supposed to be doing with all of our sublimated cultural activity? What are we doing? Are we building communist utopia? What are, what are we doing with all this sublimation? I think it's a, a perfectly good question. The second question is, can the legitimate sexual satisfaction that is permissible offer acceptable compensation for the renunciation of other satisfaction. So in other words, if we're to put all of our sexual activity into marriage, is that adequate compensation for the renunciation? And this is the type of question that I think is emerging in the current discourse with figures like Esther Perel, simply. E Esther Perel is asking these questions. She, she's just saying, What's with this universal neurotic fixation and how do we deal with polymorphous expressivity and so forth? In what, and then final, the third question, in what relation do the possible injurious effects of this renunciation stand to its exploitation in the cultural field? I think this is an even deadlier question than the other, other ones, because I think that for example, for someone like me, for someone, I'll, I'll just be explicit with my own uh, concern here. For someone like me, I am uh, heterosexual. I have a strong sex drive and I use education and social constraint to sublimate my cultural activity but in what ways can I be exploited in the cultural field? I'm all the time being exploited in the cultural field. The, so these questions, we need to answer these questions. I think these are so important questions for today. And that's, that's the, that paper. <laughs> it's, it's such a good paper. It's my, it might be my favorite paper yet. It's such a good paper. You always save the best papers for last. I have to save it for last. <laughs> yeah. Let, let me just say one thing that's very important. Um, he didn't use instinct nowhere in this paper. Mm. Um, he said sex, sexual trip, which is sexual drive. Yeah. Um, so he doesn't say instinct uh, in regards to sexuality. I think it's important I, I always look at what the uh, he said in german if the english translation is instinct 
because there is a German word for instinct, and he would have used instinct, but usually he says drive. So, yeah, yeah. I think his questions were answered by the Great War. Can you go into that? The renunciation and sacrifice were coordinated by nations. Sacrifice for the nation. The first question. Also the third question. Exploited. But do you but do you think that these questions have a new meaning in 21st century context? Uh, yes, of course. Of course. Uh -huh. I, I don't because I think these questions, these questions appear to me to be questions which define whatever historical epoch we're in where those questions were less necessary to ask in probably the ancient world. I think that they're, they're almost, these questions kind of uniquely emerge in our time where there's a bigger space of, or a gap between sexual demands for reproduction and sexual enjoyment. And also, also the necessity and the kind of structural requirement of sublimation. Because it seems like in the information age, where we're all becoming intellectual workers, there's a higher demand of mental activity than ever before. And, and these, these questions um, it's almost as if because we're not answering these, this is my interpretation, it's almost because, because we're not answering these questions, we risk unconscious sexual permissivity or uh, perversion, and on the other hand, unconscious ideological warfare. There's so much ideological warfare, which is just disproportionate to actually perceiving the problems of our era, which seem to be to be problems of people don't know what to do with their minds. <laughs> it's just like people are going mad. Like just this, like just like to put it in our current context, like look at what happened at the White House this week, for example, like it's unprecedented. It, that hasn't happened since 200 years. It's, it's, it's it's an explosion of 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 of, of symptoms. <laughs> also, banning of the president from the media, from social media. Yeah, he was banned from Twitter, banned from Facebook. But what I uh, found very interesting is that I realized how like how dangerous sex was like you could have it once you, and a kid and everyone would know about it and everyone you know, would get shamed probably as a woman even more as an than a man because as a man you can say oh i don't know maybe it's not my kid absolutely but, so right now we have loads of technologies which we can use to prevent uh all of this so yeah we're totally in a different stage we're past stage uh, three like freud um, is saying here but even in the first stage, he says that it wasn't repressed, but I can't imagine that it wasn't because. Good point. Like imagine like you're in the desert or whatever, and you know that if this woman is going to get pregnant, we're not going to survive. So we have to repress our sex sexuality. I, I, think, yeah. I think he probably regrets proposing this stages because mm. I, I think he probably, and I think we'll we'll see that because the my my main reason for thinking he probably would regret these stages is because it contradicts totem and taboo. Mm. Because in totem and taboo, he doesn't have this view at all about primitive sexuality mm. being. But I, but at the it's same, it's kind of Rousseauian. Yeah, it is. It is. It is Rousseauian. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is Rousseauian. But I think that's also, that's interesting, right? Like Freud, 
he's talking about the telephones and all the uh, communication devices, how much strain that is on our uh, lives already. And right now, like, I don't, I think it's like 30% of the internet traffic is porn. Yeah. Quite so a bit. It maybe like with social media. Huh? Sorry. It competes with social media. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe you could say that social media is also already a software porn. Because if you go to the algorithm and look at it, it's like so many young women and so many young men like who are strong, you know, like this gets pushed a lot on Instagram. That's why I couldn't yeah. take it anymore. But um, yeah. yeah, so I, I wonder what Freud would have thought about it. Like if you said to him, like, okay, in a few, in a hundred years, everyone will have screens and they will just watch and they will, can satisfy their own sexual drives without even needing another person. Yeah, because I, I think... don't think it solved anything. <laughs> Well, no, it didn't. It didn't solve anything. But I think he, yeah. in in for example, his three essays on sexuality. He does he does come up with a theory of sexuality, which forces us even to consider why man and woman even come together at all. Yeah. Like because there's a pre genital love object, and and there and then there's the then there's the the way in which the sexual erotic drive could easily have a substitute object which isn't a man or a woman and satisfy itself and i think that's what we're seeing with like for example the internet where the sex drive is linking itself to a virtual surface it's it's linking itself not to a body to another human body it's linking itself to a virtual surface and reproducing itself I think that I think that's that this is totally out of Freud's universe. But the theory, but the theory because, can accommodate it. Because that's the thing, right? Like uh, the, the virtual. So uh, what I think of is hentai. You know these Japanese anime um, cartoons. They are porn. <laughs> and so is this perversion or not? On the one hand, it's definitely sexual. Like they're getting fucked. They're screaming and everything. And on the other hand, it's like whatever i don't even know like you have the craziest like aliens robots octopuses with 15 dicks like it's the craziest <laughs> thing ever like yeah beyond my imagination um so is this perversion or not that's absolutely perversion but it's Octo also an, o o an octopus with 15 dicks <laughs> <laughs> but it's sexual right absolutely. it's not it's still genital. Yeah, but it's perverse because it's not serving the reproductive function. But is sexuality ever doing that? That's what he's saying is that that the whole stage three of civilization of sexuality is not permitted unless it's concentrated in marriage serving the reproductive unit. Okay. That's what he says forms the neuroses. It, it, the, the, the crucial pathway is that you have the original autoerotic nature of polymorphous perversity. The, the infant's entire body is erotic. Yeah. And then you have the concentration of all of that energy in the genitals. And then the genitals need to link up with the genitals of the opposite sex. And then they need to put all of their sex into one container and then they need to reproduce themselves and serve a higher cultural value. But um, I think I'm just very postmodern here or whatever, like, because for me, the question of reproduction is totally contingent. Like I see myself being 50 and like not having a kid or maybe I would have two kids, which I love, you know, I couldn't go Freud, without. Freud would so, agree with you. That's why he's against it. But this contingency, so what yeah. is... He, he agrees with you. It's contingent. Reproduction is contingent. So, but isn't it then not the goal of sexuality? He's saying, no, he's saying we make it the goal through our cultural institutions. Uh, we, do, we put religious sanctions. We do it. 
Now I wonder why, though. For the perpetuation of civilization. Why? <laughs> That's my question. Like, why? I don't know. It's, uh, why would we want that? I think I think it's that you you take this most precious energy of the individual and you capture it. The, 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 like, for example, in, in Nicholas Luhmann's terminology, it would be that it becomes part of the symbolic social system. It becomes a part of the semio-creature. It becomes a part of the, what Bard calls the socion. It, it becomes, you are owned by the civilization. Yeah. It's that's so, why, it's, that's, it's that's why, yeah. that's why Kant and his, what is enlightenment put so much emphasis on, but you're an individual. Don't forget that you can think for yourself. Even women should think for themselves. He says, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's too far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but it, like, if you look at the traditionalists today, I'm making a joke about that, obviously, but if you look at the traditionalists, they will say, like I had a guy who I was living with last month who said the biggest mistake our culture made was letting women vote. Hmm. Like they are, they, they, like the traditionalists, like the monarchists, there's people who are like the, 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 there are people who think that all of this was a mistake, that we should be back to being owned by the civilization. But now I think, but I, I think they, I don't think they get it right. I think we're being owned by the civilization in a, in a, in a weirder way now. I, I think we're being owned in a different way. It's almost like, it's almost like the, the sociant or the symbolic social creature, whatever you want to call it. It's almost like it's morphed. It's this infinitely morphing thing, which can, which can now tolerate our perversion and sucks up our perversions and uses them against us just in the way that it, you know, it can always suck up whatever is coming up and use it against us in a different way. Like, like how capitalism infinitely reinvents itself. Like it never goes away. It just becomes more strange and monstrous and changes its form. Like capitalism might not have been able to handle just what we are today in Freud's time. So, okay, like I always, when I read all these papers and Freud and psychoanalysis, I always get Nazi experiments, uh, like in fantasies of Nazi experiments of like, okay, so imagine you take some, okay, not babies because, but like young people, two, three, and you just give them a place and they're all having their needs satisfied, but you're not telling them hey, there's this thing, it's called sex, you can do it, and then you will reproduce. Like, what? <laughs> how will, would their knowledge develop on this? I think it's an obscene fantasy by me, and we'll, I don't know if we'll have an answer, but yeah, maybe it's not even justified. Uh, regarding with uh, what Dimitri said about forum, Okay, we live in a, in a new forum era. But my uh, question is like, uh, okay, I mean, if human beings are the only animals that need a fiction in order to have uh, sexual intercourse, so I, I, aren't in our uh, normal sexual relationship relations are also kind of pornographic in need of a fiction? So. Uh, I mean, uh, how can we put the blame on pornography if even our daily life, normal sexual uh, relations are perverse in that sense? That needs a fiction uh, uh, that animals actually don't need. Uh, this is... oh. Okay, so I don't, I wouldn't put any, I don't blame pornography for anything. I'm not even against, I'm not even against pornography. I'm I'm even pro pornography. <laughs> like, I, I don't, I, like I don't get I don't care. I think it's up to every individual to regulate their own. Uh, but the crucial thing is, 
to me, I don't moralize that. I'm just more interested in it. Like if, for example, if some Japanese guy wants to marry an anime character, go for it. Marry a fucking anime character. I don't give a shit. Like maybe I'll marry an anime character. They're much easier than women. That's for sure. But like, the, 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 the interesting thing is, and I go into this in the Sex Masculinity God book in chapter nine on the future of sexuality, that sexuality, we should even question man and woman. We should question fully even that man and woman come together and have sex. Like the sexual drive, the sexual drive is, that's like, like Dimitri said, that's contingent, not necessary. If you want to do that, it's your choice. But that's because, but I think, Kadal, that's I think where my difficulty lies. That, okay, re in regards to my, not, to the Nazi experiment. So <laughs> these people, okay, so what my um, prognosis would be, or like hypothesis that these people would stay perverse for a long time and maybe eventually they, they'll do like uh, sexual activities. And then maybe they will even find out that, like, why is my belly growing? And oh, I'm, like, would, would they think like, oh, I'm reproducing or not? Because isn't that very interesting that why, why is sexuality for reproduction not another perversity? Like the act in itself, which is like a uh, genital. Okay, I understand that that's not perverse. But isn't it perverse to have this ideational thing in your head of oh I will have a child and he will be the best son ever and he will be my best friend and isn't that kind of a perverse idea like imagine like having sex and thinking about that, that that's weird no yeah I I well there's a few questions there so in regards to your I don't know if we need the Nazi experiment because we have for example um we have, for example, um, ethnographies on hunter-gatherers and they didn't always have the correct biological hypothesis on sexual reproduction. They had hypotheses on how it worked, but it wasn't always the, our modern understanding of what it was about. Like, for example, there were some tribes who thought that if a woman had sex with many different men, that each man would contribute his yeah. essence to the woman. That's nice. Which is not, which that's interesting or, but, but it's wrong, but it, it's, yeah. it's, that's, it's, 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 it's interesting. Um, and is the idea of the, is the neurotic impulse perverse? I think Freud answers your question because he says neurosis is the negative of perversion. Meaning that the idea, the neurotic idea is a sublimated perversion. Okay. So he's saying he's saying instead of directly acting out the perversion, it's turned into this neurotic idea of I'm gonna have a son and he's gonna live out for me and he's gonna do all the things I couldn't do. All these types of things, these these types of neurotic ideas are the negative of perversion, the the inability of you to be fully perverse. But okay, just to defend my Nazi experiment is that okay. like hunter gatherer <laughs> tribes, they they did have de 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 developmental knowledge, like they had they had elders and they could ask questions to elders, but these children in my experiment they don't have that. I think I think how it's interesting what you're saying. I think how development unfolds has to be understood in its historicity meaning it's historical epoch or it's, yeah. or it's transcendent, like, I don't know, it's some Heideggerian notion of the horizon of being of a certain epoch. Like how the development will unfold will depend on, like I could imagine, for example, a post-human or a transhuman era where sexuality naturally develops into something totally different. But because of the conditions of our bodies, the conditions of what we are now we have to deal with this this particular historical developmental trajectory 
And to know that we're dealing with this particular historical developmental trajectory would be, to me, the Hegelian absolute knowing. Is that, that we don't see that as, a, we don't see that limitation to our absolute knowing as preventing our access to the absolute, but directly enabling our ability to think the absolute of this moment. So your experiment, the Nazi experiment, I mean, like, for example, there's a book by, I think, Jared Diamond called, like, un I, I forget the name of it, but it's like un Unfortunate Natural Experiments or like experiments which, were, which are unethical, but which happened. So we have the knowledge of them. Um, I think you could do these types of experiments, but I think what you would discover about the sex drive would be how the sex drive develops spontaneously in this current historical horizon, which would be 21st century context with the internet, with who, I don't know what access to the outside world or information they would have, for example. Yeah, no, I, no, they would be in like a cupola, you know, like a big uh, bowl with like nature and they couldn't uh, you want to like recreate like an original natural environment or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know what you would discover, but you, you would discover something, I'm sure. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I know. No. Boards concerned with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think I agree with you that like, uh, or maybe it's, you're not saying that, but like, yeah, it's like I would discover some, some weird things, but in the end, it wouldn't give me any answer on my situation right now. And no, like the real questions I'm with. Um, so, yeah, I think for the questions you're dealing with, you're yeah, you're you're going to have to I, I would advise you to avoid the Nazi experiments and to continue with self experimentation. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah, I do. I do see that what Freud says as the first stage of, of sexual civilization in his model in this in this paper, I do see that there's a lot of people today who would like to act that way. Meaning that they want to act their sexuality out with no concern for reproduction. Uh, Dimitri, do you see that? Yeah, totally. But yeah, yeah, that's also, you know, we're, we're in a totally different epoch. Like it's this time of like, be yourself because you're good like you are already. Just today, I remember that in in uh, school when you were like, was it, when I was like five or seven, they were singing these songs about how you're good the way you are and it's good that way. And like, yeah, this is totally <laughs> kind of it's not like, hey, we have to sublimate, you have to sit still and shut up and read these boring text textbooks, but it's like, yeah, you just be perverse and yeah. And 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 here and here you are with us on a Saturday morning reading boring textbooks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't take it to me myself anymore. <laughs> Mads, yeah. do you have any do you have any view on the I don't want to, don't mean to call on you but do, do you have uh, any any ideas here for this these papers? Uh, yeah, I'm just listening to <laughs> you guys. Um, well, I, what I was mostly thinking about when I read the second paper was this um, yeah, where to start like the there seemed to be a change in like the, I thought a lot about Nietzsche also when I uh, read it because of like the, the, the prudishness of, um, or the, the slave moral. Um, and today it seems like um, we move beyond that in some sense. So, so that the, like the desire becomes not just allowed, but an obligation. You and must enjoy. Huh? Yeah, you must enjoy. And I see, it seems like it's both present in the sublimation and in the sexuality itself. Exactly. So I feel like the, the paradox is, is like, 
in Freud's time, you're obligated to be prudish. Yeah. And now you're obligated to be perverse. Yeah. So like from uh, the Nietzschean idea of slave and, and uh, master moral, it's like the, the negation of the slave moral now is not back to the master moral, but it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's the demand to enjoy. So, yeah, so I think there is a lot of, or there is something different going on today. And well, there is, there is also a, a reaction formation against permissivity where there's a lot of like trad, like traditional uh, youth culture, where there's a lot of people in youth culture today which are trying to be like almost ironically conservative, but, but, but conservative basically in their, in their view of sexuality and 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 trying to like for example the like the 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 in the philosopher queens uh, philosopher queens uh, Rachel and and um, Raven on the Stoa they talked about how the contemporary they're trying to break out of the opposition between the SJW woman and the trad wife the traditional wife and the SJW woman. Like that, this is kind of like a opposition, identity opposition that that women are dealing with at the moment. Is do I just be a free subject, be a w woman do, has free sexuality, or do I do traditional sexuality and be a mother? And I see this tension. I see this tension. It's super strong in. In, in women in their 20s and 30s, especially intense around their question of reproduction. Do I reproduce? For them, the question of reproduction is, it, 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 it's so strong because it, every, their body reproduces the baby. So much of their identity, so much of their sexual affect is tied up in this. I think in one of these papers, Freud, but Freud made an interesting idea, uh, made an interesting notion about how the institution of marriage fails women on this issue of sublimation, saying like, for example, that a woman, a mother having a baby on her, on her teat, on her breast, that's not going to solve her sublimation issues. But maybe also for men, the, the sublimation issue of creating something out of nothing is, is also- uh, It's overwhelming. Like, yeah. For men, men have totally a different, this is why I think we need to talk about sexual difference because the problem of sublimation and the demands of our sublimation in this era are so unclear. Like if we don't do the traditional life, having a family and kids and doing all that, which takes up all your time and energy and all your affect. Like I wouldn't have time to do this. So, but if, 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 if you go that traditional life path, then a lot of your problems are solved by the, by the fact that you have no time or energy for anything else. Yeah. I also thought maybe it was a stray thought I have. It was almost like, so there's a move from, like sexual energy or drive. I don't know. I, I guess for me, they are related, like, like the, the pure drive. I, I don't know if it's like that for Freud, if it's similar to, to uh, like Nietzsche and uh, Heidegger, but, but it's almost like the, the movement then to the sublimation and it doesn't work and we go back and fully indulge in the like that sexuality needs to be able to hold everything because we fail in the sublimation. Sub, in sublimation. I don't know. I, I think, I think it's, it's to, in my, in my head, from my current vantage point, it, 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 there is something of this telos that Freud's identifying like I even wrote about it before I ever even read Freud, 
one of my first scientific papers is this idea I have, it's literally the scientific paper is titled um, the, the, the possibility of the end of biological reproduction, where I just hypothesize this cultural sublimation beyond biological reproduction. That, that there's this higher process which is uh, unfolding, which is towards higher cultural sublimation, but that it's so difficult and risky to do it, but there's also tremendous rewards in doing it. But it's but you're you enter into very high levels of uncertainty by sublimating. Yeah, high levels of reward and risk. Like for example, if you're just sublimating culturally, you could become some fantastic figure in whatever field you're sublimating into. And you could have lots of whatever, fame, recognition, money, uh, attention, whatever. But it's totally uncertain and probably you'll fail. Yeah, and you have to, uh, you have to f uh, fight the pitfalls of, um, of desire. It seems that, that, that like the will has been hijacked by the, the spiral of desire in society. Can you go into that? That like instead of uh, like asserting your will on your world, you're being captured by the, the, the spinning wheel of endless desire, like going for the, the, the thing that sh the, the house, the family, the thing that should fill the hole. I see. I see. I have this. I have this image in my head of, of um, from Rick and Morty. Morty. Morty's dad. Morty's dad was in this computer simulation, but he didn't know he was in a computer simulation. And he, this computer simulation was was uh, emulating his work environment. He thought he was just at a regular day at work, but he was actually in a computer simulation of his work, and the work gave him some special prize for his high achievement and then all and he's so excited i got this prize and then all of a sudden the simulation breaks and he just falls into the void it's like this uh all of these i think that's a great metaphor for when we try to ach achieve in our career and get the prize you know the nobel prize or something that it's just all in a void you know yeah. it's all in a virtual matrix I have a question because, uh, it, okay, sublimation in this sense, it's an, a neurotic thing. It's the negative of just letting loose the perversion. Yeah. But can't we, like, is it not possible to watch like an hour of hentai every day and go on to be the greatest, whatever, like pop singer or the... I, I, don't know, I think what are I, I think, I think, that, I think absolutely, because I, I think that that would be a particular compromise for like the watching hentai mm -hmm. would be a neurotic ceremonial. Like it, it would be your little private ceremony, uh, your little compromise formation with the reality of your situation. And that it, could, not... it could leave completely, it could completely leave the social life untouched. You don't have to tell anyone about your neurotic ceremony. But isn't it perverse? I thought it was perverse. Yeah, yeah. so, but there, I think, let's not get this confused. They're a continuum of the same thing. Where the, the neuro, so say for, let's, let's use the example you're giving. So let's say, Dimitri, you are a fantastic, whatever, studier of German, studier of German idealism, whatever it is you do, whatever it is that you end up doing, yeah. say you do it 100%, you're the best at it. And all the while, you're, being, you're not having sexual relations with a woman and you have a little neurotic ceremonial, you have a little ceremony, private ceremony with your hentai. That would be the compromise formation of not being fully perverse. 
Okay, so it's included in the neurosis. The neurosis will always have to have a secret little perversion. Ah, okay, I see. Yeah. The global identity will be neurotic, but the secret ceremony will be the little place where the perversion can be. Because you can't get rid of it. Yeah, this is crazy because how I'm also <laughs> thinking of it, uh, the, <laughs> yeah, that uh, in regards to social media, right? Because, yeah, on Instagram, they added these reels. It's like these videos. And like I went on there and it's just the most softcore porn shit ever. And also, if you go to, I don't, maybe it's me in the algorithm and I'm being the perverse one. In the YouTube, in, on Facebook, you have these videos. And also there, it's the most common low denominator shit ever. And most of it is heavily sexualized. Like young girls walking around, a girl comes and it's like the, it's the most brain dead thing ever. But uh, yeah, it exists. So like, I think it's very interesting that we have 30% of the internet traffic as porn, which is a kind of... It might even be higher with these things you're saying, yeah. Dimitri. Yeah, but like then the that's like unconscious. But that's unconscious. You know, people like they go into incognito mode and go to there. But then later on, they eventually it comes into the Instagram, into Facebook. And like we're all like the, the porn and also the, the, the family pictures and also the pictures of like a woman you're into. They happen on the same screen. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Maybe I like five, I think you, you I think watch porn you're... and then you see a photo of a family and then a cute cat and then a girl you like. So everything is meshed together. And I, I'm just wondering about, you know, what will be the consequences of this in 10, 20 years? Or like right now, what is this doing to our sexuality? Like this is a hugely different phase we're in right now. I think it's incredibly important what you're saying. I, I think we all experience it. And probably in your generation, even more intensely. Or maybe more, more closer to the real of your social life. But it's, 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 it, like, I think if we take the reality of things like Instagram, TikTok, whatever it is the programs are, all of these things, are, there's so much soft core porn in these things. Like the, the boundary line, like this is what Esther Perel says about sexuality is that we can't study sexuality scientifically because you don't know where to draw the mm -hmm. line. Like, like, and the boundary line between, like, this is the crazy shit. The boundary line between Pornhub and TikTok and Instagram and YouTube is going to get blurry. It already is blurry. Because I've seen, I've seen stuff on TikTok that would then get it uploaded to Pornhub. <laughs> as, if it, as if it was Pornhub content. <laughs> yeah. So it, yeah, you it, also have Zizek uh, videos on Pornhub. Exactly. So we're example. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Zizek Peterson debated on you porn as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, like That's great stuff. Uh, Matt, mad Slovenian man brutally demolishes Canadian <laughs> psychologist. <or something. laughs> wow. Yeah, it's interesting that it worked right, uh, like that, right? That we had, so what you said, like you have this neurosis and then you, you can do your secret little perversion. And yeah. then it maybe it, to generalize, it used to be that you go on Facebook to like your family pictures and then you go to this other website. But now it's like within each of these platforms, it's like this perversion itself is arising. Yes. Yes. I mean, is, is the, I mean, the reality, the reality of the thing is, is like, it, it brings me to Freud's formulation of the unconscious is the unconscious knows no, no. So it's just this, hmm. just this, like, I don't like when I, when I, when I've brought up some of these things and when I've shown some of these weird sites and, and phenomena to my friends, it's like one of the reactions I get is that you can't stop it. 
Like you, you can't, it can't, it can't be stopped. It's coming to the surface. It's, it's, you can put all the prohibition. The best thing to do would be, I don't know. I don't know what the best thing to do would be. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it simply is. Simply is, and 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 I don't know if we work out the contradictions of it. I don't know what the ultimate conclusions of it will be. There's a temptation in my head. There's a temptation in my head to think through these ideas of what Freud's saying of a a progressive sacrifice or a progressive renunciation, and like that that the internet forces us to in our individual experiences to work out the contradictions and the tensions of the whole of civilization in one generation or something like that hmm. something mad like that like we have to experience everything condensed into one generation and work throughout this entire dialectical paradox in one generation with all of the, like, we have to bring to our consciousness what the meaning of all these renunciations and, and sacrifices are, and we have to experience directly the pain of why the limits are the limits, or what are the limits. I don't know. I don't know if this is just, this could also just be absolutely disorient this is this is probably better to situate a uh, elenka zupanchik's uh, object disoriented ontology <laughs> mm -hmm. this is where the disorientation comes in all right guys i'm it's thus there's anything else you guys want to want to say is there anything else you guys want to say about these papers otherwise i'm gonna i'll just do a little summary and then and then we're out okay all right, so the first paper, we discussed obsessive actions and religious practices, basically going on this idea that the private neurotic activities of Freud's patients somehow gives us insight into the psychological nature of religion and the origin of religion, and that they're kind of inversions of each other. Um, and then in the second paper, we talk about civilized sexual morality and, and nervous illnesses um, and basically talk about this historical tension that Freud observes between our, our instincts, our drives, and um, demands of civilization, basically. And that this is intensifying, that the demands of civilization are intensifying, and that the, the need to renounce and repress is intensifying and that um, there will need to be a conscious revisioning of, of, of civilized sexual morality if we are to, to understand kind of this dialectical tension between the two. And I think that that's already kind of happened. It's just been forced upon us that we have to deal with it. Um, but this is sort of a, also a window into some of Freud's ideas, which become the foundation for uh, books like Civilization and its Discontents. And I think that also you see here the limits of early Freud as it relates to um, the type of ideas that Freud comes up with in Beyond the Pleasure Principle and the Death Drive. Um, and you don't see any of that in these papers. And I think that the analysis suffers as a consequence of that. But um, also you get a very, there's some very remarkable formulas in these papers. Uh, and I think there are some formulas which are spot on as it relates to the uh, relation between the nev ne neurosis and the perversion, for example, and even the, the sort of relationship between the individual neurotic ceremony and the religious ego ceremony in social life. So very interesting. Thank you guys all for, for joining me. And um, I will um, see you guys in two weeks, hopefully. So thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.